My name is Carly, and I never thought my life would turn into such a roller coaster. It all started when I was working as a perfume sales manager at a high-end department store. One day, a tall, handsome guy walked into the store. He looked nervous, fidgeting with his phone as he approached the counter. Hi, he said, his voice a bit shaky. I need help choosing a perfume for my mom. I couldn't help but find his concern for his mother endearing. Don't worry, I reassured him. We'll find something perfect. Let's start with some popular choices. As we sampled different fragrances, I learned his name was Michael. He was 28, worked for his family's construction company, and lived nearby. We chatted easily, and I found myself drawn to his warm brown eyes and shy smile. After nearly an hour, we finally settled on an elegant floral scent. As I wrapped up the bottle, Michael hesitated. Um, Carly? Would you like to grab coffee sometime? My heart skipped a beat. I'd love to, I replied, trying to keep my voice steady. That coffee date turned into dinner, which led to more dates. Michael was sweet, attentive, and made me laugh. We shared similar interests in movies, hiking, and trying new restaurants. Before I knew it, we were officially a couple. Everything was perfect until the day I met his mother, Evelyn. Michael had warned me she could be a bit intense, but nothing prepared me for the reality. We arrived at a fancy restaurant for a family dinner. Evelyn sat at the head of the table, her sharp eyes scrutinizing me as we approached. She was impeccably dressed, her graying hair styled in a severe bun. So, this is the girl you've been seeing, she said, her tone cold. She barely acknowledged my extended hand, giving it a limp shake. Michael's father, Robert, seemed nice enough, offering a warm smile. His older brother, Thomas, gave a curt nod. As we sat down, Evelyn launched into an interrogation. Where did you say you work, Carly? I'm a perfume sales manager at. She cut me off. Retail, how quaint. And your family? What do your parents do? I tried to keep my voice steady. My dad's a high school teacher, and my mom. A teacher? Evelyn's eyebrows shot up. Well, I suppose someone has to do it. The dinner continued in this vein, with Evelyn making thinly veiled insults and dismissive comments. Michael squeezed my hand under the table, but said nothing to defend me. As we left the restaurant, Evelyn pulled me aside. Listen carefully, Carly, she hissed. I run this family. I decide what's best for my sons. If you want a future with Michael, you'll need to prove your worth. I was too shocked to respond. When Michael proposed, I was over the moon. But my joy was short-lived. Evelyn immediately took over the wedding planning, dictating everything from the venue to the guest list. I tried to stand up for myself. Actually, I had some ideas. Ideas are nice, dear, Evelyn cut in, but let's leave this to the professionals, shall we? Michael gave me a pleading look. Just go along with it, he whispered. It's easier this way. And so, I watched as my dream wedding transformed into Evelyn's spectacle. I told myself it was just one day, that things would be different once we were married and living on our own. The first few months of marriage were a whirlwind. Michael and I moved into a small apartment, and I reveled in the joy of setting up our own space. But even as we unpacked boxes and arranged furniture, Evelyn's presence loomed large. She'd drop by unannounced, often when Michael was at work. Just checking in, she'd say, her eyes scanning our home critically. Oh dear, is this how you've arranged the living room? Let me show you a better way. I'd grip my teeth and smile, reminding myself that she was just trying to help but her help felt more like an invasion. One evening, as Michael and I were having dinner, my phone rang. It was my boss, offering me a promotion to senior sales manager. I was thrilled, it was the opportunity I'd been working towards for years. The next evening, we sat around Evelyn's dining table. The tension was palpable as she served a roast that looked perfect, but tasted like cardboard in my mouth. Carly, Evelyn began, her tone sickly sweet. Michael tells me you've been offered a promotion. How, nice. 
I nodded, trying to keep my voice steady. Yes, I'm very excited about it. Evelyn's smile tightened. Well, dear, I think it's time we discussed your future. Your real future. We need someone in sales, and with your experience, you'd be perfect. I took a deep breath. Evelyn, I appreciate the offer, but I'm happy in my current job. I don't want to leave it. The temperature in the room seemed to drop 10 degrees. Evelyn's eyes narrowed. I see. So, you don't consider yourself part of this family then? I felt my temper rising. With all due respect, Evelyn, you don't get to decide what's best for my marriage or my career. Evelyn stood up abruptly, her chair scraping against the floor. I think you need to reconsider your priorities, young lady. Michael, talk some sense into your wife. As she stormed out of the room, I turned to Michael, expecting support. Instead, he looked torn. Carly, maybe we should think about this. Mom knows what she's doing. The drive home was silent, filled with unspoken words and growing resentment. As I lay in bed that night, staring at the ceiling, I realized that my battle wasn't just with Evelyn. It was with the entire dynamic of this family I had married into. The tension in our home grew thicker with each passing day. One Sunday afternoon, we were all gathered at Evelyn's for a barbecue. I was in the kitchen, helping to prepare salads, when Evelyn's voice carried from the patio. It's such a shame, she was saying loudly. I remember Thomas's ex-wife. She was just as ungrateful as Carly. But I showed her the door. I kicked her out of this family myself. I felt my cheeks burn. Thomas, Michael's older brother, shifted uncomfortably. Mom, please, he muttered. But Evelyn was on a roll. I'm just saying, a woman should know her place. Isn't that right, Robert? Robert, Michael's father, just grunted noncommittally. I'd noticed he rarely spoke up against his wife. I couldn't take it anymore. I marched out to the patio, salad bowl in hand. Evelyn, I said, my voice shaking slightly. If you have something to say to me, why don't you say it to my face? The backyard fell silent. Evelyn's eyes narrowed. Fine. You want to know what I think? I think you're not good enough for this family. You're stubborn, you're disrespectful, and you're pulling Michael away from his responsibilities. I felt like I'd been slapped. Responsibilities? You mean being your puppet? Carly, Michael pleaded. Please, let's not do this here. I whirled on him. And you? When are you going to stand up to her? When are you going to be a husband instead of a mama's boy? The moment the words left my mouth, I knew I'd crossed a line. Michael's face crumpled, and Evelyn looked triumphant. You see, she crowed. This is who you really are. A spiteful, ungrateful girl who doesn't appreciate what she has. I felt tears pricking at my eyes. Without another word, I turned and ran into the house, grabbing my purse and keys. The weeks following the barbecue incident were tense. Michael and I barely spoke, tiptoeing around each other in our own home. I threw myself into my work, staying late at the office, to avoid the suffocating silence at home. One evening, I returned from work to find Michael sitting at the kitchen table, a serious expression on his face. We need to talk, he said. Mom called today. She wants us to come over for her birthday dinner next week. I felt a knot form in my stomach. Michael, I don't think that's a good idea. Please, he pleaded. It would mean a lot to me. And maybe, maybe it's a chance to start over? I wanted to refuse, to tell him I was done playing nice with a woman who clearly despised me. But the hope in his eyes made me hesitate. Fine, I said finally. But this is the last chance, Michael. I mean it. The night of Evelyn's birthday arrived and I found myself standing in front of her door, a forced smile plastered on my face. As we entered, Evelyn greeted us with her usual fake warmth. Carly, dear, she cooed, air kissing my cheek. So glad you could make it. I was worried you might be too busy with your, little job. I bit my tongue, reminding myself to stay calm. 
the evening progressed with forced pleasantries and thinly veiled insults. I noticed how Evelyn dominated every conversation, her sons and husband merely nodding along. As the night wore on, Evelyn announced it was time for cake. Carly, be a dear and bring out the cake. And don't forget the candles. I headed to the kitchen, grateful for a moment's respite. I carefully placed the candles on the cake, counting under my breath to make sure I had the right number. Back in the dining room, I set the cake down in front of Evelyn. Her eyes narrowed as she counted the candles. Carly, she said, her voice dangerously sweet. There's one extra candle here. Can't you even do a simple task correctly? Or perhaps you're trying to insinuate something about my age. No, of course not, I. Enough, Evelyn snapped. She began plucking out the candles, one by one. Since you've clearly ruined the design, you might as well see the mess you've made. Come closer, dear. Take a good look. Hesitantly, I leaned in. Suddenly, I felt a hand on the back of my head, pushing me down. Before I could react, my face was shoved into the cake. I gasped, struggling to breathe as frosting filled my nose and mouth. After what felt like an eternity, Evelyn released me. I straightened up, sputtering and wiping cake from my eyes. The room was silent, save for Evelyn's cruel laughter. Oh dear, she chuckled. Looks like someone's made a mess of themselves. I looked around the room in disbelief. The other guests were averting their eyes, some letting out nervous giggles. And Michael. Michael was staring at the floor, his face red with embarrassment. Without a word, I turned and fled to the bathroom, locking the door behind me. As I scrubbed the cake from my face, I could hear muffled voices outside. A soft knock came at the door. Carly? It was Michael. Are you okay? Do you need help? I yanked the door open, fixing him with a glare. Help? Now you want to help? He looked away, unable to meet my gaze. Mom can be a bit, eccentric sometimes. We just need to. Eccentric? I hissed. Michael, she assaulted me. And you just stood there. Without another word, I pushed past him, grabbed my purse, and headed for the door. I drove home in a daze, my mind reeling from what had just happened. The days following Evelyn's birthday disaster were a blur of tears, arguments, and sleepless nights. Michael tried to apologize, but his words rang hollow. I threw myself into work, staying late at the office and taking on extra projects. But even at work, I couldn't escape Evelyn's influence. One afternoon, as I was assisting a customer, I heard a familiar voice that made my blood run cold. Excuse me, I'd like to speak to a manager. I turned to see Evelyn standing there, a malicious glint in her eye. My colleague, unaware of who she was, directed her to me. I'm the senior sales manager. How can I help you? I asked, trying to keep my voice steady. Evelyn's lips curled into a cruel smile. I have a complaint about the perfume I purchased here last week. The problem is that this perfume smells like cheap chemicals. And when I tried to return it, your staff was incredibly rude to me. I knew she was lying. We had a strict quality control process, and our return policy was more than fair. But before I could respond, she continued her tirade. This is unacceptable. I demand to speak to your superior immediately. My manager, alerted by the commotion, hurried over. What seems to be the problem here? Evelyn launched into her fabricated story, painting me as an incompetent manager who had personally sold her a defective product and then refused to help. I tried to interject, to explain the situation, but my manager held up a hand to silence me. I'm very sorry for your experience, ma'am. Please, come with me to my office. We'll sort this out immediately. As they walked away, Evelyn shot me a triumphant look over her shoulder. I stood there, humiliated and angry, as my colleagues whispered around me. An hour later, my manager called me into his office. His expression was grim. Carly, I've received multiple complaints about your performance recently. And after today's incident. I'm afraid we're going to have to let you go. 
I felt like the floor had dropped out from under me. What? But those complaints, they're not real. It's my mother-in-law, she's trying to. He held up a hand. Carly, please. I understand you're going through some personal issues, but we can't have them affecting your work like this. I'm sorry, but my decision is final. I left the office in a daze, my personal belongings in a small box. I drove home, tears blurring my vision. When I arrived, Michael was waiting, his face etched with concern. Carly, what happened? Mom said. Your mother, I spat, just cost me my job. I recounted the events of the day, my voice rising with each word. And you want to know the worst part? She used our phone number to file those fake complaints. Our phone number, Michael. The one you gave her without even asking me. I locked myself in our bedroom, ignoring his pleas from the other side of the door. As I lay there, staring at the ceiling, I realized I was at a crossroads. I couldn't keep living like this, constantly under attack from Evelyn and unsupported by my own husband. The weeks following my job loss were some of the darkest I'd ever experienced. One evening, as I sat at our kitchen table, surrounded by job listings and unanswered applications, my phone buzzed. It was a text from an unknown number. I hear you're looking for work. Maybe it's time to reconsider my offer. Evelyn. I stared at the screen in disbelief. How had she gotten my new number? I'd changed it specifically to avoid her. As if on cue, Michael walked in. I held up my phone. Did you give your mother my new number? His hesitation was all the answer I needed. Look, maybe, maybe we should consider her offer. It's for us. For our future. I stood up abruptly, my chair scraping against the floor. Our future? Michael, there won't be a future if this keeps up. If something doesn't change, and soon, I don't know if I can stay in this marriage. The silence that followed was deafening. Michael looked stunned, as if he couldn't quite process what I'd said. Finally, he spoke, his voice barely above a whisper. I'll talk to her. I promise. Just, give me some time. I wanted to believe him, but I'd heard similar promises before. Still, what choice did I have? I nodded, not trusting myself to speak. The next day, I decided to take matters into my own hands. I couldn't wait for Michael to stand up to his mother. I needed to find a job, to regain some semblance of independence. I reached out to an old colleague who had started her own online perfume business. She was sympathetic to my situation and offered me a position as an online consultant. The pay wasn't great, but it was something, a lifeline in the storm. But Evelyn wasn't done with me yet. As Christmas approached, the annual family gathering loomed on the horizon. I dreaded it, knowing it would be another opportunity for Evelyn to belittle and humiliate me. The night before the gathering, Michael and I had another argument. He wanted me to make more of an effort with his mother, to try to understand her perspective. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. Her perspective? I sputtered. Michael, her perspective is that I'm not good enough for this family, that I should quit my job and become her puppet. How am I supposed to understand that? He looked away, unable to meet my eyes. She's just, set in her ways. If we could just. No, I cut him off. I'm done trying. If you won't stand up for me, for us, then I'll have to do it myself. As I lay in bed that night, staring at the ceiling, I made a decision. Tomorrow, at the Christmas gathering, I would confront Evelyn once and for all. I was tired of being a victim, of letting her control my life. Christmas morning arrived, and with it, a sense of foreboding. We arrived to find Evelyn's house already bustling with activity. As we moved into the living room, I could feel Evelyn's eyes on me, assessing and judging. The rest of the family was already there, Robert, Thomas, and various aunts, uncles, and cousins. The afternoon progressed with forced pleasantries and thinly veiled insults. Evelyn, as usual, held court, dominating every conversation. I noticed how she kept bringing up the topic of children, her eyes darting to me each time. Finally, during dinner, she addressed me directly. 
Carly, dear, she said, her voice dripping with false concern, I couldn't help but notice you're not drinking. Any, special reason? I felt my cheeks flush as all eyes turned to me. No, Evelyn. I'm just not in the mood for alcohol. Her eyes narrowed. Hmm. Well, I do hope you're not having difficulties in that area. It's just, well, you're not getting any younger. And with your career struggles, I thought perhaps you'd be focusing on more important matters by now. I stood up abruptly, my chair scraping against the floor. More important matters? You mean like being a submissive wife who gives up her dreams to please her mother-in-law? Gasps echoed around the table. Evelyn's face contorted with rage. How dare you speak to me like that in my own home? No, Evelyn, I shot back. How dare you treat me like this? I am your son's wife, not your punching bag. I've had enough of your manipulation and your cruelty. I turned to leave, but as I passed Evelyn, everything seemed to happen in slow motion. Evelyn made a sudden movement, knocking over her mug of hot tea. The scalding liquid splashed directly onto me. I screamed in pain as the hot tea soaked through my clothes. Evelyn, however, seemed unfazed by what she had done. She grabbed my arm, pulling me close. Listen here, you little brat, she hissed, her voice low and menacing. You will obey me. You will do as I say. Or I will destroy you. Through the haze of pain, I looked around the room, desperate for help. But everyone, including Michael, seemed frozen in shock. Finally Michael stood up, his face pale. I, I need some air, he mumbled, before fleeing the room. In that moment, something inside me broke. Without another word, I wrenched my arm free and ran out of the house, ignoring the chaos erupting behind me. I drove to the nearest hospital, my skin still burning from the tea. As the doctors treated my burns, which thankfully weren't severe, I felt a strange sense of calm wash over me. When I finally returned home, the apartment was empty. I packed a bag with essentials, wrote a brief note explaining that I needed time away, and left. I woke up in the dingy motel room, my skin still tender from the burns. As I was contemplating my next move, my phone rang. I hesitated, half expecting it to be Michael, or worse, Evelyn. To my surprise, it was my father-in-law, Robert. Carly, his voice sounded strained. Can we meet? It's important. Curiosity got the better of me. Okay, I said, giving him the motel address. An hour later, there was a knock at my door. I opened it to find Robert standing there, looking more disheveled than I'd ever seen him. His eyes were red-rimmed, and he seemed to have aged overnight. Robert, what's going on? I asked, gesturing for him to sit down. Carly, I'm so sorry, he blurted out as soon as I let him in. There's something you need to know about the company, about Evelyn. He paused, his hands shaking slightly. The company, it used to belong to my parents. Evelyn, she tricked my father when he was sick. Made him sign everything over to her, made herself the executive director. I felt my jaw drop. What? But how, why didn't you say anything? Robert's eyes filled with tears. I was a coward. I've been collecting evidence for years, but I was too afraid to do anything with it. He reached into his jacket and pulled out a thick folder. But I can't stay silent anymore. Not after what happened yesterday. I need your help, Carly. With trembling hands, I opened the folder and began to read. What I found inside made my blood run cold. Evelyn had been hiding income for years, evading taxes on a massive scale. She'd been hiring undocumented workers, paying them a fraction of what they deserved and forcing them to work in appalling conditions. These workers, afraid of deportation, never complained about their treatment. But it got worse. The documents showed that many of the company's products were defective, failing to meet basic quality standards. Evelyn had been knowingly selling these subpar goods at full price, putting profits over people's safety. Then I came across a police report that made my heart stop. Thomas's ex-wife, who had worked in production, had discovered these illegal practices. 
she had threatened to report Evelyn to the authorities. In response, Evelyn had pushed her down a flight of stairs. The poor woman had sustained serious injuries, but Evelyn had intimidated her into silence. Shortly after, she had pressured Thomas into divorcing his wife. I looked up at Robert, my hands shaking. This is, this is horrible. How could she do all this? Robert broke down, tears streaming down his face. I'm so sorry, Carly. I should have spoken up years ago. I was just, I was afraid. Of her, of losing everything. But I can't live with this guilt anymore. As I watched my father-in-law cry, a mix of emotions washed over me. Anger at Evelyn's cruelty and greed. Sympathy for Robert and all the workers who had suffered. And a growing determination to put an end to this injustice. We contacted a reputable lawyer, Amanda Chen, who specialized in corporate fraud cases. She listened to our story with growing concern and immediately agreed to take on the case. It was a Tuesday afternoon when all hell broke loose. My phone exploded with notifications, missed calls, text messages, and voicemails, all from Evelyn. I steeled myself and listened to one of the voicemails. You ungrateful little witch. Evelyn's voice screeched through the speaker. How dare you turn my husband against me? I'll ruin you for this, do you hear me? I'll destroy you. The barrage continued relentlessly. Evelyn called every few minutes, alternating between threats and attempts at manipulation. When I blocked her number, she started using other people's phones. But it didn't stop there. Evelyn launched a full-scale character assassination campaign against me. She contacted friends, family, and even my former co-workers, spinning a tale of how I had seduced Robert and turned him against her. The biggest blow came when Michael sided with his mother. He showed up at my new rented apartment, his face a mask of anger and betrayal. How could you do this to us, he demanded. To my mother? I tried to explain, to show him the evidence, but he refused to listen. I don't know who you are anymore, he spat, before storming out. As I sat there, reeling from Michael's rejection, I received an unexpected call. It was Thomas, Michael's older brother. Carly? It's Thomas. I, I heard what's happening. I want you to know, I believe you, and I want to help. Thomas's support was a turning point. He provided additional evidence of Evelyn's misdeeds and agreed to testify in court. With his help, we were also able to locate his ex-wife, Maria. Maria's testimony was damning. She recounted in detail the incident where Evelyn had pushed her down the stairs, as well as the subsequent threats and intimidation. As the trial date approached, Amanda worked tirelessly. She tracked down several of the undocumented workers Evelyn had exploited. Despite their fear, many agreed to testify, their stories painting a horrifying picture of abuse and exploitation. The trial was grueling. Evelyn's lawyers fought dirty, trying to discredit our witnesses and paint Robert and me as conspirators. But Amanda was brilliant, methodically presenting our evidence and dismantling the defense's arguments. The turning point came when Amanda presented the evidence of how Evelyn had manipulated Robert's father into signing over the company. The judge listened intently as Amanda argued for the annulment of the will. After what felt like an eternity, the judge made her ruling. The will was annulled, and ownership of the company was returned to Robert. Furthermore, the judge ordered a full investigation into the company's practices and Evelyn's personal finances. As the gavel fell, I felt a wave of relief wash over me. Robert broke down in tears beside me, while Evelyn's shrieks of outrage echoed through the courtroom. The aftermath of the trial brought sweeping changes to everyone involved. As soon as Robert took control of the company, Michael, true to his mother's influence, resigned from his position. He cut off all communication with his father, unable to forgive what he saw as a betrayal of his mother. Robert found unexpected support in Thomas. The father and eldest son, both having experienced Evelyn's manipulation firsthand, formed a strong partnership. Together, they began the arduous task of restructuring the company, determined to run it ethically and efficiently. The legal proceedings didn't end with the trial. 
Robert filed for divorce, a process that was surprisingly quick given Evelyn's fall from grace. In the settlement, he left her the house they had shared for decades. It was a generous gesture, considering everything that had happened. The court ordered a thorough audit of the company's finances, and the results were staggering. Years of creative accounting and tax evasion came to light. Evelyn was hit with a massive fine and ordered to pay $500,000 in back taxes. The house Robert had left her became her only asset, and she was forced to sell it to settle her debts with the tax authorities. Meanwhile, my own marriage had crumbled beyond repair. Michael's unwavering loyalty to his mother, even in the face of overwhelming evidence of her misdeeds, was something I couldn't comprehend or accept. We filed for divorce, and I felt a mixture of sadness and relief as I signed the papers. As I contemplated my next steps, Robert approached me with an unexpected offer. Carly, he said, his voice warm with gratitude, I know you've been through hell, because of our family. But I want you to know that I consider you family still. We're rebuilding the sales department, and I'd like you to be a part of it. What do you say? I was touched by his offer and, after some consideration, I accepted. Months passed, and slowly but surely, I found my footing. I learned to navigate the intricacies of the construction business, mastering the art of selling everything from lumber to specialized tools. My experience in luxury retail, surprisingly, proved valuable in dealing with high-end clients and custom projects. It was on a routine shopping trip that I had an unexpected encounter. As I turned down the cereal aisle, I froze. There, just a few feet away, stood Michael and Evelyn. They looked haggard, a far cry from the polished appearance they once maintained. Evelyn's voice, shrill and angry, carried clearly. You weak-willed idiot, she berated Michael. Can't you do anything right? I asked for the bran flakes, not the sugary garbage. Michael, his shoulders slumped, muttered an apology and reached for another box. I felt a pang of pity, seeing how their toxic relationship had endured and seemingly worsened. For a moment, I considered approaching them. But as I watched their dysfunctional interaction, I realized I had nothing to say. Instead, I quietly turned my cart around and left the store, leaving my shopping unfinished.